enter a uterus, uh, which may not have a connection to the endometrial cavity or which may have a connection to the endometrial cavity. And then there are three uh, intrauterine pregnancies. So here is a pregnancy occurring in that um, a superolateral angle of the endometrial cavity. This is an intrauterine pregnancy called the angular pregnancy by some. And here's a bicornuate uterus with a pregnancy in, in one horn or cornu. And here is the septate uterus, which also has a pregnancy occurring in one of the horns. So there you have it, the five cornual pregnancies, two of which are ectopic pregnancies, the interstitial ectopic and the rudimentary horn ectopic, and then three of them intrauterine pregnancies, the one that has been called angular pregnancy, the one in the cornu of a septate uterus, and the one in the cornu of a bicornuate uterus. So let's look at the um, ec cornual ectopic pregnancies. So the interstitial ectopic pregnancy occurs in 2 to 4 percent of all ectopic pregnancies. So the um, conceptus implants in the interstitial part of the fallopian tube that passes through the corneal muscular portion of the uterus. It creates a bulge uh, in the superolateral um, fundal margin. Now here's a 3D a representation of how the uh, endometrium suddenly continues into a thin um, tube, and that's the beginning of the interstitial part of the tube. Now these uh, ectopic pregnancies rupture uh, a little bit later than usual, less th around 12 weeks or so, and they can result in fatal massive hemorrhage. Uh, that's why we have to pay attention. Now, some of these have been called coronal pregnancies, but we should be calling them interstitial ectopic pregnancies. So what's the difference? Well, the main premise is that the fallopian tube does not have an endometrial lining. Therefore, it does not have a decidual basalis layer, and that does not interact with the pregnancy the way it does in the uterus. So the trophoblast that grows um, or the conceptus in the interstitial part, the trophoblast grows right through the mucosa, invades through the muscularis and the serosa, and almost acts like a placenta accreta or a morbidly adherent placenta. So there are abnormal uh, attachments of this placenta, which then leads to rupture. So years ago, um, Ackerman described um, the interstitial line sign, which is a line that extends from the endometrial cavity and it points to the uh, ectopic gestational sac. Um, however, uh, in our experience, uh, this is a quite a rare kind of sign. It's very difficult to see this sign. Um, and uh, so you can look for it. We always do look for it. But I think uh, what is more important is to look for a hypoechoic band of myometrium between the endometrial echoes and the gestational ectopic uh, sac. Here you can see it on another patient. We have uh, a break um, in the myometrium, and then we have the bulge and the gestational sac. Here's another example. There's the interstitial ectopic pregnancy and we have a band of hypoechoic myometrium separating the two. I think that's a much more valuable sign. Uh, we often talk about the thin uh, myometrial band around the interstitial pregnancy, but I would suggest to you that it is more important to look for the myometrial band on the side towards the uterus uh, and document that. That'll really help you make a decision. There are mimickers uh, of an interstitial ectopic pregnancy. The number one mimicker is the pedunculated myoma that's degenerating. That can certainly look like a gestational sac. Here's another example uh, given to me by um, Dr. Cullinan, uh, one of the greats in ultrasound who has, um, who's no longer with us. What helps us here to decide on this uh, is the bridging vessels, the vessels coming from the uterus to feed this pedunculated myoma. 
uh, that is in contradistinction to what happens with the interstitial ectopic pregnancy where you have a ring of vessels around the pregnancy. So the, the things that form a ring of vessels in the body uh, are usually a, a gestational sac or the corpus luteum. So obviously this is a, a pregnancy here. Now the uh, rudimentary horn ectopic pregnancy. So the um, malarian defect that we have here shows us that the second part, the second uh, uterus that fuses together does not form. It, it's only in a rudimentary form. You get the unicornate uterus, which has typically this uh, banana shape. Uh, and this little uh, rudimentary horn could have a connection with the endometrial cavity, so they can bleed um, vaginally, uh, but it may not have a connection. Uh, and the bleeding uh, goes first into the peritoneal cavity and may not be discovered so quickly. Uh, the pregnancy grows, and as you can see here uh, from this uh, article, uh, in JUM that uh, the pregnancy looks just like uh, a, um, an ectopic growing in the tube. Um, that's hard to distinguish. The MRIs may help us uh, give a clue, uh, and of course 3D ultrasound can help us. Now here's a surgical specimen from a patient in our hospital. She had such a um, pregnancy in the uh, horn and this is at 10 weeks it started growing. Uh, there was a lot of uh, consternation about how to handle this pregnancy because uh, the diagnosis was very difficult. We did 3D, we did MRI. Uh, the problem is that they usually rupture in the second or third trimester, which leads, of course, to fetal demise and hemorrhage. Uh, and the placenta becomes morbidly attached um, in the uh, pelvis or in this region. Uh, so usually they are excised. Uh, sometimes uh, they can be injected with potassium chloride or methotrexate. That has been attempted. And there have even been rare reports of a delivery. Um, but those are the ones that tend to have a thicker myometrium surrounding them. Now the three Cornwall-type pregnancies that are, that are actually intrauterine pregnancies. So that's this term, angular pregnancy, bicornate uterus, and septate uterus. So let's look at them. So what is this angular pregnancy? This is not a term that we use very often. I think it is um, very important for you to be descriptive uh, when you describe this, more so than using that term. So this is an implantation that occurs in the superlateral angle or corner of the endometrial cavity. Uh, if you do MR or if you looked laparoscopically, this would be located medial to the uterotubal junction, medial to the round ligament. Now, the um, gestational sac becomes eccentric, and on the surface of the uterus, there's a bump, hence the cornwall term. But uh, this pregnancy uh, has a very good opportunity to continue growing into the endometrial cavity. Um, here's a 3D uh, representation. It's very clear that this is intrauterine. It has a broad interface with the endometrial echoes. So that's going to be our key versus the other one, interstitial ectopic, which had myometrium that we could see there. So here's, it's eccentric. It has a, an adequate um, mantle of uh, myometrium surrounding it. Uh, it is uh, widely associated with the echogenic endometrium, and it is considered an intrauterine pregnancy. Now, it's been in the literature uh, since 1981. However, we dropped this term because we were not good at seeing these with our older equipment. It is more recently now that the term has come up in the literature because we have these high-resolution uh, transvaginal probes and 3D ultrasound. Now, in the literature, you will find that this pregnancy is associated with uh, high risk of spontaneous abortion, uterine rupture reported up to almost 24% of cases, and abnormal placentation, that is, the morbidly adherent placenta or placenta accreta. Um, 
Now, the risks here uh, possibly are higher than they actually are uh, because a number of interstitial pregnancies have been mixed into these reports, not being clear on the separation between the interstitial pregnancy and this, ectop uh, uh, this uh, eccentrically placed gestational sac. So many cases may have actually been interstitial ectopics. There are some reports in the literature, however, that um, are not showing that favorable of an outcome. Now the way you can think about it is the pregnancy has the opportunity to go two ways. It can continue growing into the endometrial cavity, which I think is preferred. However, for some reason, it may continue growing outward, in which case the outcome is more disastrous. And that